Please help support the channel by visiting our Amazon store, affiliate link below. Hey, what's going on everybody? My name is Matt Jarbo. This is Three Buck Theater and today is September 19th, 2017. And there is a whole bunch going on in Hollywood, especially following the aftermath of the Emmys with Sean Spicer showing up to parody his first day as White House press secretary. And of course, the subsequent fallout from that. And I just want to say, you know what? Grow up, Hollywood. All right. Like you spend all this time attacking him. He comes out into the lion's den, so to speak, a lifelong Republican. He makes fun of himself. He makes fun of his job. He pokes fun at himself. A little bit of self-deprecation there. And while I all I hear is just like, oh my God, the screeching, the screeching. Like I, I'm I'm a liberal, and I'm even telling you, calm, 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 calm down. It's stupid. Otherwise, the Emmys were dumb as well. All right. Like Netflix had 92 nominations and barely took anything home. That's dumb. But anyway, that's that's nothing to do with movies. It's all about TV. I just wanted to talk about that. But first things first today, I want to talk about this rumor we're hearing coming out uh, of Star Wars, which apparently, and this is probably not true, but it's in, it, it's it's possible that it might be, uh, Darth Vader is going to be in the Han Solo movie. That's what I'm hearing. That's what this report says. It says that a source close to the production has revealed that the actor who played Darth Vader in Rogue One not Hayden Christensen, but the actor who played him in Rogue One is currently on set filming uh, this new Star Wars movie. So again, we have no idea what that means. We, we don't know anything about that at all. Uh, but that's essentially what this report is saying. However, contradictory uh, reports have come out from the actor himself a while back that said, I have no involvement in this project. But things can change. And let's be let's be fair here with enough of the 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 criticism that's been levied at Kathleen Kennedy for pulling Phil Lord and Chris Miller off the movie. Uh, never, never mind the fact the whole situation involving Colin Trevorrow and, and everything else. It's entirely possible that they at Lucasfilm are going to want to try to bring in Darth Vader as a cameo, as another cameo, in order to be able to, you know, further kind of give it to fans, you know, and that's kind of what it feels like to me. It feels like this is one of those cameos that doesn't need to be there, but they're like, who else can we put in this thing? You know, I mean, if we pod it, if we brought in C-3PO and R2-D2, that would be probably a little bit too much because at this point in time, they're off with uh, the Rebel Alliance and everything else. Uh, if we brought in, you know, Leia, that would just throw off continuity. Uh, who who could we bring? Who who could we bring in? Oh, let's bring in Vader because Solo is a smuggler and clearly going to have run-ins with the Empire. So that makes the most sense. Fine. I get it. And a lot of this has to do, I think a lot of the excitement from this has to do with the response to the Vader uh, cameo in Rogue One, which let's face it was amazing, was like, oh my God, awesome. And that was part of the reshoots, which is just, you know, shows you that a scene like that needed to be in there and it worked really, really, really well. The dad joke stuff from the previous scenes with him, eh, that could be cut out. You could have just had that scene at the end with him and it would have been just as 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 awesome of a cameo appearance. Uh, but that being said, this isn't confirmed at all, but I wouldn't be too surprised if Vader shows up. Uh, Lucasfilm at this point is probably going to do a little bit of fan service for a while in order to show everyone who's maybe a little bit uh, a little worried about what's going on over there at Lucas that hey, everything is fine. No, we're good. We're fine. We're fine. We're good. Nothing's nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. Uh, everything is fine. How are you? Like, we're going to get a fair amount of that. And that's relatively okay with me. I just don't want them to do what they did with the Star Wars comics, because in the Star Wars comics uh, that came out at the end of 2015, the very first issue, which picks up after like months after the end of uh, the, a, a New Hope, it has Luke and Vader fight each other in a lightsaber battle. Right. The entire the entire like and that destroyed everything, all the momentum going into Empire Strikes Back, you know, so it's like that was their first time meeting, their first time fighting, their first time engaging, you know, Vader realizing that this is his son and everything else. Like there was a lot that went into that moment. And then here the comics, which are now considered canon, are just like, yeah, like they're going to they're going to meet, and they're going to fight. And it's Luke's going to get his ass handed to him and whatnot. It's like it was stupid. It was stupid. It was dumb. It didn't need to be there. And that's just kind of their meddling, in my opinion. So hopefully if this is going to happen, it's tasteful. It's a cameo. It's brief. It's there. It's done. Move on. I'd be more surprised uh, or I'd be more surprised if there wasn't a cameo by by Boba Fett, because we know that the Boba Fett movie has been rumored having him show up as being a bounty hunter hot on, you know, uh, Solo's trail or him meeting him for the first time. 
would be something that is pretty cool. And we do know that John Hamm, who um, is, you know, Don Draper and stuff, is going to be voicing Boba Fett for an upcoming audiobook. So I wouldn't be surprised if that ties into him voicing the Boba Fett character that pops up in the Han Solo movie. There's been no set photos. Again, pure speculation. But at this point, that's pretty much what I'm thinking. All right, so this last weekend, Darren Aronofsky's mother dropped, and no one went to go see it. It only made like $7 million compared to its $60 million take-home. Uh, and the movie scored itself an F cinema score, meaning audiences just did not like it. But a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's kind of like an experimental horror film. Some people are going to like it, others are not going to like it. This is Aronofsky, so it's kind of to be expected at this point. Looking at his previous films, we basically know what to expect from him. Uh, he's not a crowd pleaser. He's He's not a crowd pleaser at all, but he works well in certain genres. And this movie is just divisive across the board. My best friend went to go see it, hit me up afterward, and he was like, it was almost like the director was behind you in the movie, constantly tapping you on the shoulder going, do you get it? Do you get the symbolism? It's about the Bible, you know, and, and basically telling me like that. And uh, it's, it's, yeah, I saw the trailer for it in front of it. Uh, it looked like a grindhouse. It's like, you will never be the same again after seeing Mother. And I'm like, didn't I see these kind of trailers like 10 years ago for the grindhouse double feature that came out? Like, I don't get it. That doesn't really feel like an Aronofsky-esque film to me. And now I know that that's essentially a misleading trailer, which is probably one of the reasons why audiences just didn't like it. What they thought they were getting in terms of a preview was not a preview. It was most definitely uh, not what the film was, and that's having its impact. And so much so that Paramount actually came out to defend the movie, right? Paramount's coming out to defend it, which is pretty funny considering how much in poor shape, you know, Paramount is right now. But this is what they said. Uh, the movie is very audacious and brave. You're talking about a director at the top of his game and an actress at the top of her game. They made a movie that was intended to be bold. Everyone wants original filmmaking and everyone celebrates Netflix when they tell a story no one wants to tell. This is our version. We don't want all movies to be safe and it's okay if some people don't like it. Okay, fine. That's a fair statement to make. Absolutely. You want to come out. You want to defend this movie. You spent millions of dollars on. You, you marketed it poorly. Audiences didn't get it. You want to come out and basically be like, you just don't understand the artist's vision. Right? Jennifer Lawrence has come out to defend the movie because she's dating Aronofsky. This, of course, coming out uh, just days after she announced that she's going to be retiring for two years or taking a, a bit of a leave of absence from making movies. Uh, many people have speculated this has a lot to do with this movie being a failure, and it's just kind of a, a long line uh, in the string of failures that she's had recently. And so as a result, people are just kind of like tired of Jennifer Lawrence, and so she's going to go away for a while, which is, again, there's nothing wrong with that. It actually seems to make sense. As I said in the last episode she'd be better off really just going to tv for a while and 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 kind of cutting her chops there and building up a better recognition before trying to come back to some of these big blockbuster type films and keep in mind that you know she carried the hunger game movies but the x-men movies she was pretty much given center stage in x-men apocalypse and more so or well in x-men days of future past uh, simply because they wanted to bank on her popularity from Hunger Games and that failed to have an impact in that particular marketplace. But Paramount also defending this movie from like the stance of the audiences just don't get it and then also trying to, you know, lambast Netflix for creating new content. Uh, it's also the fact that, you know, this is a different medium. You know, Netflix is not studio controlled. Netflix isn't trying to be studio controlled and lets its creators create. But it does create some stuff that's sometimes experimental, sometimes avant-garde, you know, and it does uh, take chances. But it also makes content that is easily consumable for a multitude of different audiences, and that's one of the reasons why it excels. And to sit there and claim that a, you know, a, a digital streaming service that predominantly focuses in long-form television-style storytelling and not so much in movies, I think is pretty ridiculous. What they should have done is been like, look, you wanted to see original movies. Baby Driver did really well. Some other original films did really well that weren't part of a larger universe, that weren't part of anything else. Uh, you, you know, get out. Like, those kind of movies did well. Focus on that as being the, 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 the comparison factor here. Don't sit there and try to go, but Netflix does it. And you wonder why Paramount is taking the shit constantly. You know, they're just not making lots of money. And, and that's a problem because they're a good studio that used to put out good content. Thankfully, one of the heads of uh, one of the execs of Warners has now moved over to Paramount. Maybe that will right the damn ship. 
Okay, with Kingsman the Golden Circle coming out in a couple days and reviews being you know, fairly good, some negative, but mostly good, everyone's been interviewing Matthew Vaughn about what he's going to do next. Now, it was reported a while back that he was talking with Warner Brothers about possibly heading over to do uh, the next Man of Steel, Man of Steel 2 or whatever they wanted to call it, probably Man of Steel 2 or just Superman, probably given what he says here, just Superman. And he doesn't want to focus on that right now because clearly he wants to promote his his newest movie um, <laughs> that he wrote and directed. Uh, but uh, he can't help it when these things come up. You know, he even said he let it slip and he even said he feels bad for that. But when asked about what he would do in terms of making a Superman movie, here's what he had to say. And it's very interesting. He says, weirdly, if I did do Superman, I think my main take would be it's really boring, but make a Superman film. I just don't feel a proper Superman. I think Donner did it to perfection for that time, just doing the modern, I just want to do a modern version of the Donner version, just go back to the source material. For me, Superman is color, feel good, heroic. He's a beacon of light in the darkness, and that's what I think Superman should be. And a lot of people out there are super freaking on board with this, because people out there are like, oh, Man of Steel was too glum and too gloomy and too blah. Look, here's the deal. Man of Steel, I think, revitalized the character. It deconstructed the idea of Superman. It made him have to go and make choices, choices that impacted him personally, uh, like letting his father die, like killing Zod, understanding what it's like to be human. To, to protect humanity, Superman also has to understand humanity, have empathy for humanity. To have him just be... Uh, uh, you know, a guy who jumps around the world saving people all the time doesn't necessarily give him any more depth than just being a kind of a standard tropey god type character. And I think what Zack Snyder did, and not only Man of Steel, but Batman v Superman, did wonders for the character. That being said, that groundwork has now been laid, and we can then jump into uh, the more colorful, lighthearted, bright Superman, the beacon in the dark, you know, beacon of light in the darkness, so to speak. And I think now is a good transition into that particular uh, area. And we know that Warner's right now, they, they're, they're moving away from, from Zack Snyder. Um, Zack Snyder is officially out at the DCEU. He's not going to come back in and take over Justice League. I think they're going to go forward with probably Joss Whedon or other people at the helm to move it into a brighter light, like someone like Patty Jenkins. This mostly has to do with the fact that Wonder woman because it focused more on hope and optimism tended to do better with the audiences and let's say the kind of very dark very gloomy batman v superman never mind the fact that i personally loved batman v superman the extended cut and i loved what they did with batman and i love what they did with clark kent and everything else but i can understand now that those particular uh, stories have been told, those those character developments uh, have now been moved past, we can go to the next level, which is Batman finding hope, right? Seeing Superman sacrifice himself for Metropolis uh, at the end of BVS gives him hope for the future and gives him the desire to protect Earth uh, instead of being as bitter and cynical as he became. Which is, is, which is good for the character. Yeah, it's him towards the end of his career, and we can still go back and do prequel films or whatever with, a, with, with Affleck or a younger Batman or whatever to lead into that level of cynicism, to have Gotham be that dark. But going forward, his viewpoints on everything is clearly centered around the idea of saving humanity rather than just kind of letting it survive and taking out the trash where he could. And I like that. And I think getting that with Man of Steel 2 would definitely be fantastic. And we know that when it comes to comic book movies, Matthew Vaughn is definitely the guy to talk to. Uh, the work he did on not only Kick-Ass, but X-Men First Class were great. The fact that Fox grabbed him up as soon as X-Men First, or as soon as uh, Kick-Ass dropped in 2010, gave him 11 months to produce uh, X-Men First Class, and the movie came out very well. You know, it, it's a good thing. I would have loved to have seen him do X-Men Days of Future Past. I think Singer did a great job on his own, but even Vaughn has said that X-Men Days of future past is kind of where that particular trilogy ended right kind of going eh, x-men apocalypse not not so much but if he were to tackle superman i think he would make it more fun make it more enjoyable and really try to harken back to what donner did but at the same time i just I'm, i gotta say this that's what Superman Returns was. Superman Returns was a movie in 2006 that was heavily criticized for being too much like Richard Donner Superman and not actually trying to do anything new or what it did do new people didn't like. And then here it is 11 years later and Superman Returns actually got better with age, which is essentially what uh, Matthew Vaughn would attempt to do with, with Man of Steel too. It just goes to show you that sometimes movies 
can get better after a couple years than when you have your expectations set very high. Um, and I think that will happen quite a bit with Man of Steel and Batman v Superman as we go on into the DCEU. But again, that being said, if Matthew Vaughn comes on board, I am there, midnight show, popcorn drink in hand. By the time it comes out, I have my little girl. I'll take my little girl to go see it. Uh, I'm excited because this dude's one of my favorite directors. Everything he's done has been aces in my opinion, and I can't wait to see what he does with Superman um, to move away from the deconstruction and then now the rebuilding of him as that heroic beacon of light in the darkness. All right, so jumping over into DreamWorks news, I feel like we haven't heard a lot out of DreamWorks in a while. You know, they've 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 been kind of quiet. They they were on a huge, huge role for many years. You know, all the Shrek movies, How to Train Your Dragon, the Kung Fu Panda movies, Megamind, uh, you name it. They 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 were working on it, right? Mr. Peabody and Sherman, which I feel was very underrated. But in 2013, in March 2013, they released an animated film just titled The Croods, starring Nick Cage and Emma Stone. It was about a prehistoric family trying to survive and get away uh, from, I do believe it was like a volcano or something, or there was something that was coming to get them. They needed to move on to food or something. I forget, I forget the whole plot line. But either way, Ryan Reynolds is also in it, uh, and it was a cute movie. And it did well for the time. Uh, it came out, did $47 million domestic, uh, $187 million international. Um, and the thing is, I worked at a drive-in theater when the Croods dropped, and th we were busy with it a lot. It did very well uh, for the time it came out at my theater. My theater tended to, you know, they loved these kind of animated films. But then we heard about the sequel, The Croods 2, which was on the docket for quite some time, and then just... Uh, was kind of quietly swept under the rug and basically led to be canceled. Um, but the show on Netflix has actually done pretty well. Uh, they're currently going into their fourth season, and I'm pretty sure that's the reason why we're now hearing that Dawn of the Croods, Croods 2 essentially, is uh, now coming out in uh, 2020. Um, saying here actually that it comes out uh, September 18th, 2020. That's cool for me. Like I, I, the, they're they're releasing it in, in, in non uh, a, a non main category, like a non competition month in terms of animation. Uh, you know, the first one dropped in March. It was like towards the end of March 2013. Again, not super big times for animated films. Those are usually towards you know the end of the or like the summer and Christmas time and whatnot. But this one coming out September of 2020 is a good sign, and that probably has to do with the fact that we've seen a rise in films in September doing very well. Also, kind of like how we've seen a rise in movies in March doing very well. The the movie going year is no longer just confined to May through July. We're now seeing hits uh, in months where people are just like literally shocked that movies are doing well, uh, and that's cool that people. People are going multiple times throughout the year and spacing it out. And I think this is a good thing, to be honest with you. But I can talk more about that later on. But looking at uh, the Croods and the Croods 2, if they bring back the, the voice cast, I'm on board. Uh, I thought the Croods was a fantastically done, hilarious film. For what they did with it, I thought the uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the jokes really worked for a family comedy. I liked Nicolas Cage as that dad trying to connect with his daughter, but also realize that he's losing his daughter, uh, and you know trying to like go through the go through the midlife crisis and everything else. And Nick Cage, you know, Nick Cage catches a lot of crap out there. He does. He catches a lot of crap. He's not as bad as people make him out to be, and uh, I'm glad he's doing these kind of films. And I love to being kick ass as well. So like, you know, when he when he goes out of his usual norm and goes and does these kind of things, I like to see him do that. So the Croods too, or Dawn of the Croods, uh, you know, hopefully will be the shot in the arm for the franchise to keep it going theatrically, or at least to keep it going on Netflix, and also to help DreamWorks out. They were they were like they were a big power player for a while, and then they just had a couple. A couple movies that just failed to connect and failed to connect and failed to connect. And they might have spread themselves a little bit too thin on some of these things. Because the last DreamWorks movie I really remember is like The Penguins of Madagascar. I'm sure there's more since then. I'm very positive there has to be more since then. But uh, I just, uh, I don't know. And it's entirely possible too that, that you know, also the same year uh, that The Croods came out, you had like uh, Despicable Me 2, you had Frozen, you know, you had other big animated movies that year. And so it was up against a lot of competition, which might be one of the reasons why it failed to really kind of reach a larger audience. But I think Gone Home Video has done well, and I think... I think um, with Netflix, it's done well. So hopefully the sequel will be as good as the first one, if not better, uh, and, and, and get us back into that world. And yeah, I'm totally on board with that. 
All right, guys, our last story today is one that's just utterly ridiculous, but I still wanted to talk about it. There is a petition on change.org titled Lucasfilm, remove J.J. Abrams as director of Star Wars Episode Nine. Yeah, this guy named Matt Vila uh, is not happy that J.J. is going to be directing Star Wars Episode Nine, And right now it's got about 3,200, almost 3,300 signatures. Uh, and I'll, I'm sure a lot of that has to do with just people that are signing it for a laugh. But this has kind of prompted an interesting discussion uh, amongst uh, people who love Star Wars and moviegoers in general about uh, about whether or not J.J. Abrams being the choice to direct this movie is is the right one or not. And a lot of people out there are really hoping that when Colin Trevorrow had left, that they would go to Ryan Johnson or, you know, there was like a joke about Quentin Tarantino, someone else that wasn't J.J. And there are a few fans out there that are more vocal than some some maybe who who really like the movie uh, that said that J.J. Abrams just straight bastardized Star Wars Episode 7, turned it into a fluff film, took no risks, so on and so forth. But let's take a look at what Matt here says in the petition. Star Wars fans abroad were upset with the result of J.J. Abrams directing of Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens. Although not reflected in box office sales, most fans agree that Abrams' vision for Episode 7 resulted in a rehash of Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope. There was virtually no creativity and no risks taken. Such complacency cannot be the trajectory of the sequel trilogy. More specifically, the metric for success in a Star Wars movie cannot be box office sales. Lucasfilm and Disney need to listen to fan criticism. Star Wars fans deserve better. They demand better. At the start of the new sequel trilogy, the beginning with The Force Awakens, Lucasfilm and Disney promised a new director for each movie to promote a fresh new vision on every installment. With the hiring of J.J. Abrams to direct the upcoming Episode 9, Lucasfilm and Disney have both reneged on this promise. Therefore, to prevent Star Wars Episode 9 from becoming yet another ripoff of the original trilogy, specifically a ripoff of Star Wars Episode 6 Return of the Jedi, and for the good of the Star Wars brand, we demand that Kathleen Kennedy remove J.J. Abrams as director of the upcoming Star Wars Episode Nine film. All right, <laughs> let's look at, okay, like, let's address the criticisms in this particular post. All right, because there are valid criticisms to be had there, I will admit. J.J. Uh, Abrams, you know, while he did bring Star Wars Episode Seven uh, to the forefront, uh, you know, and, and helped it earn two point some odd billion dollars, he did play it a bit safe, a little bit safe in terms of how elements of the story were replayed from episode four. But then again, at the same time, when it comes to the Skywalker saga, especially in Star Wars, events are cyclical. Uh, they happen time and time again. It's just kind of the way things are, which is one of the reasons why I looked at this as making a fair amount of sense. But that's not to say that they couldn't have maybe tried a couple different things. But to be fair, though, they did take main characters from the original trilogy and then they moved them to secondary characters, giving the center stage to a new cast of people that were a black guy and a woman and a new droid. And it wasn't like they just sat there and reused the same characters out of fear of expanding the universe. They expanded the universe, gave us new characters, still had the old ones in there to help set the tone. And those characters are still going to play a major, a major part going forward unfortunately, without Carrie Fisher. So it was a risk to to do that. Uh, he could have easily just, you know, written in where it was like kind of Luke Skywalker's journey 30 years down the road and played that up. But instead, they wanted a new younger generation to appeal to a new younger generation. And that's 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 a risk right there. But it's a risk that turned into a huge reward of over two billion dollars. And like I said, uh, you know, even even with um even with Rogue One, Rogue One was a risk. It was a risk. Over a billion, I think a billion and a half dollars or whatever. So while there are people out there that don't like the movie, ultimately more people did. And JJ coming on board is a safe bet. He's a very safe choice. Uh, given everything that's happened with Lucasfilm thus far, the shakeups with the Han Solo movie, losing Phil Lord and Chris Miller, as I mentioned earlier, also uh, Colin Trevorrow bailing on episode nine uh, due to creative differences. A lot of the problem probably does lie with Kathleen Kennedy herself. I, I think that's a pretty fair assessment at this point. But that being said, that being said, uh, JJ is probably the best person to have on board in order to bring it home and play it safe in not only uh, a commercial way, but uh, but a way I'm pretty sure he'll be given more of a of a more of a say in this time around. The first time they were unsure how to do it. Uh, Ryan Johnson's going to lay the groundwork for episode nine, and then we'll be able to go from there. Chris Terrio is going to be co-writing it with JJ Abrams, not Lawrence Kasdan. Uh, and as much as that kind of sucks, it'll be interesting to see when a new writer 
will help out with in terms of fleshing out the overall story and giving it some more meat on its bones, because I think that's what Terrio is going to be able to do. So while this particular petition, I think in nature is just trying to, it's is a Star Wars fan that is trying to protect something that, that he loves, and I don't fault him for that at all. I have to sit there as another Star Wars fan, as evidenced by everything behind me on the wall, and just say, you got to give him another shot. All right, you, you have to give him another shot. Force Awakens was them taking a franchise that was laughable in the 90s, laughed at quite a bit in the 2000s, and then they rebooted it uh, in a way that was commercially viable uh, and set the story or set, set, set everything up for, for the stories to come while still operating within that space of Star Wars. And so I can understand why people don't like it, but at the same time, still better than the prequels. All right, guys, that wraps up this episode of Three Buck Theater. My name is, of course, Matt Jarbo. I thank you for sitting through me on these stories. Be sure to leave your comments below. I do look forward to reading them. Uh, if you guys haven't already, check out my Discord. There'll be a link to, to that in the video description. And also be sure to check back uh, for TV reviews of the Orville and South Park and whatever comes on up, whatever I watch on Netflix, and more episodes of here, of this show, Three Buck Theater. I'll talk to you guys later. Have yourself a great day. Peace out.